Good morning. I'm Kerry Haney. I'm a faculty member in political science and African and African American studies here at Duke. Uh, and welcome to this plenary. Uh, we have assembled another outstanding uh, panel. Uh, this has been a great conference. My, I tip my hat to Trina Gee and the folks at the law school who organized this. Uh, this morning's uh, our plenary uh, is entitled Race, Political Participation, and the Roberts Court. And before I introduce the, the panelists, I will let me make a, a couple of observations. Uh, there are 19 states, and if you add the District of Columbia, there are 20 uh, where the combined population of black, Latino, and Asian population is at least one-third of the total population. So in 19 states in the District of Columbia, the combined black, Latino, and Asian population is at least one-third of the total population. 14 of these the combined population is 40 percent of the state's total population. In 14 of these, the combined population is 40 percent of the state's total population. Uh, the Democrats, the Democratic Party, won all but seven of these states twice in the last two election cycles. All but seven in the last two election cycles. Uh, and they won North Carolina, one of the seven, once uh, in 2008. If you look at the Electoral College votes from 2012 and, 2000, uh, and 2012, Obama received 332 Electoral College votes, uh, Mitt Romney 206. Uh, the closest two contests in that election were Florida and Ohio, with a combined Electoral College vote of 47. So even if the Democrats were to lose Ohio and Florida uh, in foreseeable future, Right? The Democrats enjoy a considerable advantage at the national level in terms of the Electoral College votes. Uh, and more than this, the Republican Party uh, has to worry about some of the states that they currently have in their column, uh, North Carolina being one, Georgia, and, and I like to add Texas to this. You get some debate about Texas, but I add Texas to one of these states that the Republicans have to think about defending uh, going forward. In 2008, 65% of eligible black voters voted, 50% of eligible Latino voters, and 48% of Asian American voters voted in the election. Uh, in 2012, it was 66% eligible black voters, 48% eligible Latino voters, and 47% Asian American voters. All of these groups lean Democratic uh, in terms of their party identification. Uh, this paints uh, a picture uh, for the Republican Party that one that should frighten the Republican Party. And my comment is that it has frightened the Republican Party. And as I say to my students in, in, in my classes that much of what we see happening on the political landscape these days in terms of voter ID laws uh, and actions by various courts is in response to this scary picture before the Republican Party. Uh, so if you look, for example, I had my students go uh, and look for voter ID laws. They each were assigned to the state. It is, the assignment was to go and find when that law uh, was proposed uh, and brought to the legislature. Uh, in almost all the cases, these laws were proposed after 2008. Uh, after 2008, uh, with the election of Barack Obama as president. Uh, so part of the response, I think, to these changing demographics and the implications of these demographics has been uh, action by state legislatures and actions by the court uh, to get in the way of political participation. And I wanted to throw that out as an opening salvo, as something to think about as we uh, have this conversation this morning. So one of the challenges is contending with state action and court action with regards to participation. And, and another uh, challenge is taking this national uh, power and having it transferred to the state and local level. Because I could give you a story uh, about these same states where the Democrats have an advantage at the national level. It doesn't seem to translate into effective uh, power at the state and local level. 
Uh, but without further ado, let me introduce the panelists uh, this morning. Uh, first, uh, Ari Berman is a senior contributing writer for The Nation magazine and an investigative journalist, journalism fellow at The Nation Institute. His new book, Give Us the Ballot, The Modern Struggle for Voting Rights in America, uh, was published this year, and it's available, signed copies are available uh, at this uh, conference. Uh, Ari has written extensively about American politics, civil rights, and the intersection of money and politics. His stories have appeared in the New York Times, Rolling Stone, and The Guardian, and he's a frequent commentator and guest on MSNBC and NPR. Uh, they changed the order on me. Uh, Richard Delgado uh, is from the University of Alabama School of Law. He has also taught at the University of Pittsburgh, Colorado, and UCLA. Uh, Richard is the author of over 100 journal articles and 20 books. His books have won eight national book prizes, including six Gustavo Myers Awards for Outstanding Books on Human Rights in North America, the American Library Association's Outstanding Academic Book, and he has received a Pulitzer Prize nomination. Luis Ricardo Fraga is the author, is the author foundation endowed professor of transformative Latino leadership and the Joseph and Elizabeth Robbie Professor of Political Science at the University of Notre Dame. His primary interests are in American politics, where he specializes in the politics of race and ethnicity, Latino politics and immigration policy. Among his many publications are his recent books, Latinos in the New, New Millennium, An Almanac of Opinion, Behavior, and Policy Preferences, and Latino Lives in America, Making It Home. In 2011, uh, Luis uh, was appointed by President Obama to the Advisory Commission on Education Excellence for Latinos, for Hispanics, I think it's called. Uh, Pamela Carlin is the Kenneth and Hall Montgomery Professor of Public Interest Law at Stanford. She is one of the nation's leading experts on voting rights and the political process. Uh, she has served as the commissioner on the California Fair Political Practices Commission and assistant counsel and, co and cooperating attorney for the NAAC NAACP Legal Defense Fund and a deputy assistant attorney general in the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. Professor Carlin is the co-author of, of leading case books on constitutional law constitutional litigation, and the law of democracy, and as well as numerous scholarly articles. Next to, to Pam is Teku Lee, a professor of political science and professor of law at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, Teku is the author of several books, including Mobilizing Public Opinion, Transforming Politics, Transforming America, Why Americans Don't Join the Political Party, Asian American Political Participation, and Accountability Through Public Opinion. Teku is currently a non-resident scholar, non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and co-principal investigator of the National Asian American Survey. Last but not least, uh, Neil Siegel uh, is professor of law here at Duke. Uh, he's the David C. Eichel Professor of Law and Professor of Political Science at, at, the Duke, uh, at Duke, where he also serves as co-director of the program in public law and director of the D.C. Summit Institute on Law and Policy. Neil's research and teaching fall in the areas of constitutional law, constitutional theory, and federal courts. Uh, he teaches, he's interested in, uh, at Duke, he teaches both undergraduates uh, in arts and sciences and students in the law school. Uh, and he also teaches in the law school's uh, judges, Duke Masters of Judicial Studies program. Uh, he served as special counsel to, uh, to Senator Joe Biden during the uh, confirmation hearings of uh, John Roberts and Samuel Alito. Uh, and during the October 2003 term, he clerked for uh, Associate Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg at the Supreme Court. So each of the panelists will begin with a two to three minute opening statement, and then we'll have some, I see Louise laughing already, uh, <laughs> two to three and a half minutes opening statement. <laughs> and, and then we'll continue with the uh, questions and discussion. Well, th thank you so much, Carrie, and uh, it's a real honor to be on this panel with so many 
uh, esteemed scholars and experts in this field, and it's an honor to be with all of you guys, all of whom know much more about the law and political participation than I do. Uh, but, but I'll do my best to set the stage in the uh, two to three and a half minutes that I have uh, allotted. And so my expertise is voting rights, uh, and the Roberts Court decision that I am most familiar with is the Shelby County versus Holder decision in 2013 that gutted the heart of the Voting Rights Act. And what I tried to show in my book, Give Us the Ballot, is that there has been a tremendous revolution since 1965 as a result of the Voting Rights Act, that millions of new voters were enfranchised and the groundwork was laid uh, for so many new people to come into political power, including President Obama. But what I also show is that there has been a profound counter-revolution since 1965 to try to roll back the signature advances of the civil rights movement, and that the Shelby County versus Holder decision didn't come out of nowhere. It was the product of 50 years of opposition to the Voting Rights Act and 30 years of opposition to the Voting Rights Act by a man by the name of John Roberts. So I just wanted to quickly, in the time that I have, set the stage of how we got a Chief Justice Roberts and how he came to write the majority opinion gutting the Voting Rights Act. John Roberts arrived in Washington in 1980 as a graduate of both Harvard and Harvard Law School, and he went to clerk for Justice William Rehnquist. When Justice Rehnquist was appointed to the court by Richard Nixon in the 1970s, he was known as the Lone Ranger because he was so extreme on civil rights issues. And Rehnquist was proud of the title. He kept a Lone Ranger figurine on his desk. And Rehnquist's office were kind of like the Federalist Society before there was a Federalist Society. He was training the next generation of conservative legal scholars, one of whom was John Roberts. And I think Roberts was deeply influenced by some of the states' rights jurisprudence that Rehnquist was pushing. Rehnquist was someone who opposed the Brown versus Board of Education decision. He believed that all white primaries in Texas were constitutional, and he had personally administered literacy tests to black and Hispanic voters when he was a Republican Party official in Arizona. So first, Roberts clerks for Rehnquist, which in and of itself is illustrative. Then Rehnquist becomes Roberts' entree to the Reagan Justice Department. And the Reagan administration is really the key actor in this counter-revolution that I document, because <laughs> Reagan is someone who opposed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, he opposed the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and he opposed the Fair Housing Act of 1968. And as one NAACP activist said at the time, Reagan doesn't just want to put civil rights on the back burner, he wants to take it off the stove completely. And even more significant than Reagan was the fact that all of these young counter-revolutionaries followed him to Washington in his administration. And John Roberts was one of them working in the Reagan Justice Department under William Bradford Reynolds, the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights at the time, a very influential figure. And one of Roberts' chief responsibilities was voting rights. He was locked in a major battle with the Congress over the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act. And Roberts was writing memo after memo after memo saying that a broad interpretation of the Voting Rights Act would lead to things like quotas in electoral politics, affirmative action in elections, proportional representation. And he made this argument aggressively and relentlessly, and it impacted the highest levels of the Department of Justice. And Roberts famously wrote that violations of the Voting Rights Act should not be made too easy to prove. Now, this was an interesting argument that he was making, that the Voting Rights Act was going to lead to things like quotas, because at the time, and still today, there was a dramatic underrepresentation of African Americans and Hispanics and Asian Americans in elected offices. Uh, in the South, for example, in the 1980s, African Americans were 25 percent of the population, but they held only 5 percent of elected seats. And if you look at what happened after Reconstruction, the last black member of Congress from the South was a man by the name of George Henry White from North Carolina. He left in 1901. He was basically run out by the vicious white supremacy campaigns in this state and so many other southern states. And he gave this famous speech on the House floor where he said, I am leaving, but I will rise again like a phoenix from the ashes. The next black member of Congress from North Carolina wasn't elected till 1992. 
It took 90 years. But nonetheless, John Roberts and so many people like him were making these arguments that the Voting Rights Act was going to lead to these quotas and all of these other things. So what we see is that when John Roberts becomes Chief Justice, his argument that violations of the Voting Rights Act should, quote, not be made too easy to prove is put into decisive practice with the Shelby County versus Holder decision. And I think Roberts has made it his legacy as Chief Justice to try to roll back the Voting Rights Act and the signature achievements of the 1960s. So we'll talk more about the substance of what all of that entails, but I just wanted to set that up to show you uh, that Roberts is such an important figure over all of these issues uh, and really has, has shaped so much of what's been happening in the law in recent years. Just as a, a postscript to your, to your, your talk, Ari, um, before I uh, turn to my own remarks, uh, my uh, buddy over there and I, and I uh, teach at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, which is only a few miles from, uh, from Shelby County, where they, the, that horrendous de decision um, or originated and, and came, came down. And uh, I want you to know, you might be interested to know, that, uh, that many of our, of our students, uh, the, the progressive students in that, in that school who gravitate toward our, to our classes, are just appalled by, uh, by, by that decision and are uh, uh, very distressed about it, want to reverse it. Uh, want to re re reinstate uh, voting rights uh, in the in the South, uh, and um, they all believe in the New South. They all want to contribute to it. They want to uh, get it passed. It's a uh, it's terrible uh, tra uh, tradition, and um, and emerge into a to a, a better better day. So, uh, if you ever want to talk to some some students who uh, who share the your your concern and uh, uh, probably read read your read read your work. And who are working, plan to work very hard in their um, legal careers to uh, to reverse that decision. I, I could introduce you to some. Sounds good. Okay. We'll talk after. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, in in hopes of getting a, a handle on on what the future of civil rights uh, may look like in this country, um, Gene Stefancic, my uh, colleague and co-author, and I have been looking at uh, several years decades, actually, of fairly recent California history, uh, as well as the recent history of, of a different region, uh, the South, our, our new home. The reason is that we think that one of the shaping forces of minority fortunes, uh, including the in-court variety, how the cases come down, in the years ahead is, is likely to be the majority group's anxieties over the impending majority-minority population that's scheduled to arrive around the year 2042. The reason why California may be a good indicator, we think, of what to expect on a, on a national scale is that this large, populous state arrived at that very tipping point fairly recently with a mixed economy, a settler colonial history, a get-rich-quick spirit, and a self-image as a bellwether state, the originator of styles, uh, customs, uh, trends, and so on. California's story can tell us, we think, a good deal about how much of the country may react to, react to as it approaches that point, the demographic tipping point, 50-50. Essentially, uh, we found uh, that, that California was behaving a little like South Africa a, a decade uh, earlier in the final years of, of apartheid, when whites there, and in California too, clung to power in the face of a large, restive, black, in California's case, Latino po uh, population, by means of laws and popular referendums, uh, a host of them that you're probably familiar with. Close control over affirmative action and other avenues for the development of intellectuals of, of color who might be leader, leaders. Um, and, and, uh, and, and mass incarceration so extreme that it was virtually bankrupting the state. 
Upper class Californians also hoarded wealth and moved into gated communities, much as the white citizens of South Africa had, had done only earlier, a little earlier. So if you've ever wondered on a, on a national level about the widening wealth and earnings gap, the headline upon headline depicting police violence, the revival of eugenics, and conservative Supreme Court decisions like the upcoming one in Fisher, ponder events that you read about or observed in California and extrapolate. We don't mean, of course, that California is typical of all of the US, which really is five or six separate countries rolled into one. The South, for example, is oppressing Latino immigrants right now for a quite different set of cultural and historical uh, reasons, which Jean and I discuss on the very next panel after uh, over lunch. Uh, but uh, if you live in a city or a region that resembles California in terms of its uh, uh, economy or culture, or if you live in the South, and you want to know what the future holds, we suggest taking a, a peek at, at the Golden State. Um, my, I want to give my thanks as well to everyone for um, the invitation to come here. Um, two things I have to say, a kind of a truth in advertising. Uh, one is um, I cut my teeth in graduate school by doing uh, expert witness uh, research assistance work for Chandler Davidson um, on voting rights. And in fact, I think it was the opportunity to work with attorneys and understanding how it is that social science can, in combination with the law, together work towards social change that gave me the motivation to continue to take those statistics classes and other classes that I had to take in political science to get the PhD. The second point I want to make is that I'm a classmate of John Roberts. Uh, we were in the same entering class. We didn't know each other. Um, we didn't take the same classes. Um, <laughs> um, I don't even know if he, was a, if he was a government major or not. Um, but my guess is he didn't take the uh, class on black politics with, uh, with uh, Martin Kilson that I took. Um, that's just my guess. But um, we were there at the same time as we were with, uh, with um, Bill Gates Jr. Um, during that freshman year. Um, Roberts is the chief justice of the Supreme Court. Bill Gates is one of the most wealthy people in the world. And I'm here with you folks. Um, so um, I won. I just want to let everybody know that, that I had more fun. <laughs> um, and, and <laughs> I use that often, by the way. Um, and thinking about what I might share with you in the, um, I hope my, my time hasn't started yet, in the brief time <laughs> that I have with you, I want to use two frameworks from legal decision making to understand the Roberts Court and its position regarding voting rights. I want to use the framework of the totality of circumstances. That is, that a proper analysis requires that what look at a broad range of data to determine if voting discrimination and dilution has occurred. You have to look at history, policies, and practices. And I also, I also want to apply, in thinking about voting rights in the Roberts Court, and especially the Shelby decision, but with implications for the Evanwell versus Abbott decision, I also want to look at a results standard. Uh, because I think the court helped us understand when it changed to a result standard, um, the Congress did in response to Mobile versus Bolden, the court helps us understand that you don't just look at what people say, you actually look at what the impact is of what it is that they say and what it is that they do. The Roberts Court regarding voting rights, and I think this is made most clear in the Shelby decision, uses a logic, uses, a, uses social science, and uses a vision of American society. And I'm using logic, social science, and vision of American society as a way of thinking about the totality of circumstances that have to be considered to understand the consequences of voting rights. Uses those as ways of trying to restructure how it is that we think of ourselves as a nation. The logic that the court uses in Shelby is that equality is enough. If you will, it's, it tries to segment a particular part of our politics, electoral participation. It privileges electoral participation to try to, in my view, dissolve the foundations of a system of racial justice. That is, the equality that it claims has been attained in African-American electoral participation relative to whites 
the equality that has been attained is used as the justification for there no longer being a need for, um, for um, voting rights. It reminds me of the way in which colorblindness and tokenism are used as ways to try to similarly dissolve what is a necessary foundation of racial justice, which is what I would call true equality in politics and the need for individuals with histories of marginalization to have a true voice in identifying their own interests and being able to influence the political system. In the use of social science evidence, um, I love to refer to the social science evidence referred to by the um, majority of the court in the Shelby decision, because if that type of social science evidence were presented in an introduction to American politics class as an essay, it would receive a D minus. <laughs> The cherry picking of evidence is excruciating to understand. The way in which it avoids any consideration. I happen to be involved with a group of, of both uh, law professors and social scientists uh, in um, uh, writing one of the amicus briefs that was presented uh, to the court du uh, during the uh, Shelby case. And we presented them with, with reams of evidence of continuing levels of socioeconomic disparity, continuing levels of vote polarization, continuing um, instances of voting rights violations, uh, consistent patterns across southern states, and so forth. All of that is avoided by cherry picking a little piece of evidence that says in the 2012 election, black participation maybe even exceeded white participation, not recognizing that the reason that African-American participation was equal to white participation was because of voter turnout in predominantly African-American congressional districts that were there in southern states because of the Voting Rights Act. And using that, I mean, the, the, if you will, if you'll permit me, the deviousness, and I use that word carefully, <laughs> the deviousness of using that type of evidence and not acknowledging that African-American voters who didn't live in predominantly African-American populated congressional districts had lower turnout rates than whites. That's why it inflated the statewide average. And just looking at the state is an example of the misuse of social science evidence that is only justified by an underlying value proposition. And I think we know what that is. The third dimension I want to refer to in terms of the vision of American society that the Roberts Court uses is the fact that they are assuming that the vision of American society as one which is equal, they are assuming that dignity has been attained as a way of avoiding examining what life is really like on the ground. That is, the vision of what America can be equally participatory, right? The vision of America is what justifies not having to actually look at what life is really like. If you will, it's through the exercise of its responsibilities not to protect racial minorities that it is able to justify its vision that equality has actually been attained. It is, in fact, a fiction. And an understanding of the totality of circumstances helps us get there. Two final points. This chart behind me that happens to have been put together by, if you can see here behind uh, Teku's head, an, an excellent political scientist, uh, <laughs> my older son, Bernard Fraga, who's a, a third year <laughs> assistant professor at, at Indiana University. Um, helps us understand what actual participation has been in the United States starting in 1954 and going all the way to 2014, including 2012. And this, this line here of equality is when the population represents a percentage of the electorate consistent with its percent of the citizen always important to keep in mind in thinking of Latino and Asian American communities, the Latino citizen and Asian citizen population. And what you see here is after the 1965 Voting Rights Act, the increase that had already started, the increase in African American political participation, you see when Latinos begin to be counted separately, when Asians begin to be counted separately, as our country has become more diverse, the gap between 
Latino participation, Asian participation has been increasing as they have increased as a percent of the population at the same time that African American participation is now slightly above, if you will, equality. Notice what is consistent throughout the overrepresentation of whites. Can we, can we leave here and come back? Yeah. This is, this is the a coalition opportunity that we have to be able to, I think, put together the type of response that is needed to counter the logic used by the Roberts Court. Thank you. So it's just a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, I'd like to begin with three uh, short uh, quotations that are going to frame where I'm going. The first involves Emancipation 1865. Sighted through the telescope of dreams looms larger, so much larger it seems than <coughs> truth can be. But turn the telescope around, look through the larger end, and wonder why what was so large becomes so small again. That's Langston Hughes. I believe we are on an irreversible trend towards more freedom and democracy, but that could change. That's George W. Bush. <laughs> you are not nice. There must be some stage in the progress of the black citizen's elevation when he takes the ranks of a mere citizen and ceases to be the special favorite of the laws, and when his rights as a citizen or a man are to be protected in the ordinary modes by which other men's rights are protected. Those words are from the Supreme Court in 1883, but they could just as easily be from the Supreme Court today. Indeed, in at least one way, I think we can say that the Supreme Court today is worse than the Supreme Court in 1883 because the Supreme Court today actually strikes down laws and policies which people of color have gotten through the ordinary modes by which other people's rights are protected. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 in its amended state from 1982 and 2006 was an ordinary mode of protection that the Supreme Court has gutted. The affirmative action plans on which the Supreme Court has put a bead have been adopted through the ordinary modes by which other people's entitlements have been protected. The restrictions on statutes that deal with disparate impact that the Supreme Court has done, again, are restrictions on the ordinary modes. And that, I think, characterizes uh, the Roberts Court. Let me say just a very few words about where the court is and then uh, pull back from that to a slightly larger frame, which is uh, the Supreme Court's decision in Shelby County, uh, which Ari talked about, um, is a decision that, uh, to use words that Luis talked about as well, talks about dignity and equality as important values. But it's not the dignity and the equality of minority voters. It's the dignity and equality of states that the court talks about. And I think it's important for us to understand the ways in which arguments about dignity and equality are um, at a high enough level of abstraction more about the states and can be used by people who want to restrict voting rights just as much as by people who want to increase voting rights. So let me now pull back one step and talk about something other than the laws that are specifically about the protection of minority voters, like the Voting Rights Act. Um, and that is to talk about the way in which the Supreme Court has not only gutted the Voting Rights Act in important ways and made it harder uh, to establish violations of the Voting Rights Act, but has also unleashed what I call the second generation of first generation problems under the act, which is if you go back 10 years ago, we were all talking about vote dilution. The question was, now that uh, blacks and Latinos are voting in much higher numbers than before, are they able to elect candidates of their choice to office? But since the Supreme Court's decision in Crawford against uh, Marion County Board of Elections, which is a case that didn't involve on its face a racial claim at all. We're now back to first generation exclusions. That is the kinds of things that we got rid of with the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Restrictions on registration, uh, voter ID laws. We are in state ground zero uh, for these issues. And the Supreme Court has done something here that I just want to highlight very briefly, and that is 
the Supreme Court has replaced the Warren Court era idea that voting is a fundamental right and that restrictions on the right to vote have to be strictly scrutinized, which means that the state has to show that they are necessary to some compelling government purpose and in which the state cannot come forward with a post hoc justification, but we look at what's the actual justification for the law with the idea of an undue burden test in which everything gets balanced. And once you move to an undue burden test in which everything is balanced against everything else, uh, balance is in the eye of the beholder. And states are allowed to come forward with post hoc rationalizations. And the post hoc rationalizations that uh, you see are two. Uh, one of them is confidence in the election system, that it's OK to restrict to have restrictive voter ID laws and restrictive registration practices because this increases confidence in the integrity of the election process. And I think one of our fundamental jobs has to be to explain an election system has no integrity if large numbers of citizens are excluded from participating. That the error in excluding people, more people were disenfranchised by the, the way I'd like to say this is more nuns Retired nuns were disenfranchised in Indiana in one election than all of the proven examples of vote fraud by in-person impersonation in the entire history of the state back to the 19th century. Um, the, second, the second point I want to make about this is the argument that this isn't about race, this is about partisanship. One of the things we showed in North Carolina, and the defendants' own experts agreed with this, is it is a better predictor in North Carolina of whether somebody is going to vote for the Democratic candidate that you know that the person is black than that you know that the person is a registered Democrat. And so this entwinement of race and politics and the idea that as long as it's political, it's OK, is something that the Supreme Court seems to be moving us towards. And it's something that I think we need to develop legal tactics uh, and legal theories to combat. So I just want to start by joining my fellow panelists and previous panelists and thanking the organizers, faculty, and students alike of this conference. It's been an incredibly edifying and rich uh, day and a half so far. Um, two minutes uh, for an academic is about as much time once you get through your postulates and provisos and caveats and conjectures to, to <laughs> sneeze. Um, and I'm not even a lawyer. Um, so I'm going to try to do just uh, two things uh, with my time that I think are really important, uh, but also completely out of my wheelhouse. Uh, but I think they're important enough to a conversation like this one that I want to spend my uh, two minutes um, talking about uh, these uh, points. One is about um, what and how in relation to minority political participation, and the other is about who. So first, yesterday it was said that um, laws or legal activism is not enough, and what we really need is more politics. And as a political scientist, I want to say that politics also, narrowly uh, conceived, uh, might not be enough. And so what do I mean by that? Here's one hypothetical that I would invite us uh, all to think through. So suppose through a series of successful uh, legal challenges against voter ID laws, against Evenwell versus Abbott, against felon disenfranchisement, and by building a grassroots political movement, um, we achieved something spectacular, like a constitutional amendment that ensured that every American citizen is automatically registered to vote upon reaching uh, the age of 18 or upon naturalizing as an adult citizen. And suppose also that no state is allowed to abridge the fundamental political right of citizenship to vote by circumstance of having a felon record. And since we're in the world of hypotheticals, just for fun, let's also stipulate that Carly Fiorina has written this amendment in just three pages <laughs> and that Donald Trump will implement it and it will be fabulous. Huge, great. Um, that would be a really big deal because if you think about the most recent war on voting, a lot of it is an attempt by one political party to retain um, its hold on power by essentially diminishing what is in the denominator in terms of voter turnout. Most of our 
history of racial and political progress in this country has been a struggle to increase that denominator. And what we are seeing in a war on voting is to essentially try to shrink that denominator again. So suppose we're able to achieve uh, the most uh, uh, fundamental possible gains uh, against that war. Even if you achieve this, I think that would not be uh, enough uh, to generate the kind of higher voter turnout that we would anticipate to automatically uh, come about, and especially higher voter turnout among uh, communities of color. And I think barring that, it would also not be enough if we achieve this win to get to something like a promised land of racial justice or a fully flourishing uh, democracy. It's sort of a premise because I only have two minutes, but if you accept that promise, and I'd have to implore your intelligence there, I'd have, I'd have to say, uh, why is that why is that the case? Why is it the case that achieving something like this constitutional amendment would not be uh, sufficient? Um, again, in the time that I have, I'm just going to give you a hint of why I think this is partly the case, and it uh, is by reference to an often mentioned uh, quote from Frederick Douglass, which is that power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. So in my experience, people often focus on the first sentence that we have to demand something from power structures in order to be able to make any, uh, any gains. And quoting Douglas again, if there's no struggle, there's no progress. But I think the second sentence is every bit as important. It never did and it never will. And what that means to me is that insurgent oppositional uh, standpoints against power is a constant in a democracy. Democracy is not just about uh, formalisms in terms of opening up equal access to participate in politics. It's about struggling constantly all the time. Point two, and this will be a much shorter point, uh, and again, I'm not the right person to be raising this point since it's completely out of what I usually do, but I think it's a point that ought to be raised nonetheless. And that point is how do we reckon uh, white Americans in this discussion? I think often in discussions like this, whites are either explicitly or implicitly othered and framed as being what we are oppositional against in our work, or mentioned uh, in terms of envy for the political successes that have been achieved by the religious right or Tea Party patriots. Even when we put on our scholarly regalia or in political science, if we um, uh, focus primarily on the data. I think what we're talking about are concepts like white privilege, the invisibility, the racial invisibility of whiteness, or things like how to measure through surveys and uh, psychological experiments, things like stereotyping, implicit bias, explicit racial resentment, and so on. And I think that is all very good and very important. But what we miss, and I think what we increasingly miss uh, urgently, is the fact that the experience of what it means to be white in America and the, the assumption that there will be existing structures of uh, white privilege and white supremacy is actually uh, a changing and changing pretty radically. So I think whiteness is evolving from being a uh, default category, normative in its invisibility, to something that is being increasingly explicitly felt as an activated identity. And I think that matters for our work. So the emerging narrative of whiteness that I see is one of injury, loss, and anger. Many whites, I think, are asking themselves, maybe for the first time, a question that's often defining for the race marking of members of uh, this country that are persons of color, and well identified by Du Bois, which is the question, what does it mean to be a problem? I think this needs some attention and discussion because race is fundamentally relational. Racial inequality is a relation, polarized voting is a relation, and even if we are in this racial future that people often talk about, that sometimes, or sometime around the year 2046 or 2047, the country will become uh, a majority minority, it will still be the case at that point that white Americans will be 49.9% of the country. And if you think about how voting works, they will likely continue to be a majority of the voting electorate. And so this might be an argument to take up uh, the challenge that Madhavi Sundar presented to us yesterday to think about uh, 
racial justice from the standpoint of love. Because after all, between, sta between strangers, any kind of emotional uh, relation of intimacy is only uh, lust or maybe cheap sex, right? You really have to get to know the other to be able to have something uh, that feels uh, like love. And I think in a lot of these discussions, uh, the plight of uh, our white brothers and sisters is often an estranged uh, other. And even if you don't embrace this plea for love, I think uh, a lot of our work winds up being reactive and uh, winds up being uh, focusing on remedy rather than trying to project what a positive vision of a racially egalitarian future might look like. And so I think from that standpoint also, this is, uh, this is a question that we ought to be asking uh, in fora like this. If I had a third minute, I would talk about language as a barrier to participation, but I don't have a third minute, so I'll stop. <laughs> Well, Neil, you take four minutes. And <laughs> well, uh, thank you, uh, and thanks to all of you. I, I'm going to resist the urge uh, to go down the line and, and respond to your, uh, to, your thoughtful, to your thoughtful comments. I want to thank all of you for being here as a member of the faculty uh, at Duke Law School. Uh, your presence brings, brings honor to this place, and, I, and I'm grateful. Uh, I'm grateful for it. So yesterday, uh, Ted Shaw spoke eloquently uh, of the fierce urgency of voting. And uh, I think what I want to do with my time is resist the urge to uh, lay into certain Roberts Court, Roberts Court decisions that I disagree profoundly with, and instead, uh, at least my hope will be to uh, make you want to go and vote twice. <laughs> uh, so, as your lawyer, I'd yeah. you not to do that. No one's recording this. I said make you want to, not go and do it. <laughs> So in, per, in perhaps the, the greatest 10 pages ever written in a law review, uh, Professor Charles Black uh, uh, defended the lawfulness of Brown against Board of Education at a time when certain legal luminaries were wondering publicly and provocatively whether Brown had any basis in law. And in defending Brown's legality, Black did not emphasize that state-mandated racial segregation and public education entail discrimination against individuals on the basis of race. That is not what he argued. Instead, he made a series of devastating observations about the purposes, effects, and dominant social meanings of the institution of racial segregation in America at that time and uh, over the course of the previous centuries. Now, if we fast forward to the present, I think it's fair to say that uh, the inquiry, uh, the analytic spine of Black's inquiry, does not uh, guide the Roberts Court in how it responds to cases uh, involving racial equality or sex equality. We've had a series of conservative presidents and justices who have instead made formal race or sex classifications the harm that the Equal Protection Clause presumptively prohibits. And so it might seem like there's so much water under the doctrinal dam that there's no uh, going back to black, so to speak. And uh, what I want to suggest is that that's not necessarily the case at all. Uh, it is the case uh, that uh, the court is currently divided 5-4 uh, on several profoundly important questions implicating race or sex equality. And so imagine, and I don't think this is so hard to imagine even though we don't typically do it, uh, imagine a Democratic president gets to replace either Justice Scalia or Justice Kennedy, both of whom who are, cu are currently 79 years old. Uh, in that scenario, it seems to me that a reconstituted court would have some formidable non-formalistic doctrinal resources that it could bring to bear, and I will mention two of them. First, the court's equal protection case law already has adopted Black's approach in the area of gay rights. The court already does this. Uh, for example, in the Windsor case, where the court invalidated federal law's uh, definition of marriage as, lim as limited to opposite sex couples for more than 1,000 purposes under federal law, uh, the court did not emphasize discrimination against individuals based on sexual orientation. Instead, the court talked about the purposes of DOMA, uh, its harmful effects on same-sex couples and their children, as well as the harmful, humiliating message that it sent to them and all the world. And so you have equal protection case law currently governing that adopts blacks' approach in the area of gay rights. 
When we turn to substantive due process, how the court interprets the liberty of the due process clause in the area of gay rights, in the area of abortion rights, once again, you see more similarities than differences to how Charles Black defended Brown. In Lawrence, in the same-sex marriage decision, Obergefell, uh, you don't see uh, an emphasis on formal uh, distinctions on the basis of sexual orientation, you do see some pretty robust equality reasoning, substantive equality reasoning folded into the liberty of the due process clause where the formalistic constraints of equal protection doctrine don't apply. Uh, concerns about demeaning, disrespecting, stigmatizing same-sex couples and their kids permeate the court's decisions in Lawrence and in Obergefell. In the area of abortion rights, the governing Doctrine is set forth in the 1992 decision, Planned Parenthood against Casey. Casey is shaped substantially, to a substantial degree, by sex equality values in ways I would be happy to talk about. Later this term, I expect uh, that the court is going to actually apply uh, Casey's undue burden test. And in that case, I think the original meaning of Planned Parenthood against Casey is not that everything that can get balanced away. I think the original understanding of Casey uh, is one uh, that actually has some teeth. So when you think about this doctrinal status quo, I don't think it is some huge stretch to imagine a new court applying substantive equality values consistently under the Constitution's equality guarantee across the domains of race, sex, and sexual orientation. To be sure, some cases would need to be revisited. Some of them would need to be overruled. But they were wrong the day they were decided, and in any event, they can't be reconciled with some other decisions that are also good law. But I think the most important point is what Charles Black had to say about the matter, which is that the hugely consequential error cannot stand and does not stand. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I start with the questions, I uh, want to uh, mention that Janai Nelson from the Legal Defense Fund was scheduled to be a panelist with us this morning, and she's attending uh, the funeral of Jacqueline Berrigan uh, from the Legal Defense Fund, and that's why she's not with us. Uh, let's keep our friends at the Legal Defense Fund in our thoughts as they uh, attend the funeral uh, of Jackie. Uh, so one of the constants that I heard in your opening five minutes uh, presentation uh, was this notion, I think, Ari, you, I think you called it a, a counter-revolution. Um, and... So what happened, right? So just this revolution that took place, and I'm, and I'm glad to hear your comments. I can tell my students I'm not a conspiracy theorist when I give my presentation about this is sort of conscious decision making on the parts to counter what is happening. Uh, what happened? Did the other side fall asleep? Just lay down. Uh, so if you all could answer that question about this counter revolution, was it ever joined by the other side? Can I just start and say so? I mean. So I think a, f a few different things occurred. The, the clearest understanding is that the power dynamics in these institutions changed. So for many, many years, you had, after 1965, both a Congress and a Supreme Court that protected voting rights, uh, and that, with a few exceptions, uh, they were the allies of the Voting Rights Act. The Congress reauthorized the Voting Rights Act four times, each time with overwhelming bipartisan support. Uh, and the Supreme Court, uh, up until 1980 and then even after that, repeatedly affirmed the power of the Voting Rights Act. And then you had states across, across the country that when they tried to subvert the Voting Rights Act, they were stopped from doing so by the Voting Rights Act. So this part of the Voting Rights Act that the Supreme Court gutted, uh, Section 5, it blocked 3,000 discriminatory voting changes from 1965 to 2013. But those institutions have now changed. For many, many years, those people in Congress who were critics of the Voting Rights Act, they were the minority, even within the Republican Party. Now, the loudest voices in opposition to the Voting Rights Act have captured a majority of the Republican Party. Then you look at the Supreme Court, you have five justices, all of whom either worked for Ronald Reagan or were appointed by Reagan, who have a very different view of voting rights than those justices who were appointed 
under Kennedy and Johnson and, and, and down the line. And so, and then I think the, the political dynamics have shifted in the country. This is the, the last thing I will say, which is uh, that there were five million new voters in 2008. And of those five million new voters, two million were African American, two million were Hispanic, and 600,000 were Asian. And they voted 75% for President Obama. So if you're the opposition party, and 75% of the fastest growing demographics are voting against you, you have two options. You can either change your policies, <laughs> you could, to try to reach out to these constituencies that didn't vote for you, or you can try to make it harder for those people that didn't vote for you to be able to vote in the first place. And if you choose the latter strategy, which so many states, including North Carolina, have done, if one of your central organizing principles is to make it harder for people to vote, then you're not going to be in favor of something called the Voting Rights Act. Yeah, if I could just add a, a, li a little bit to that, I think, you know, the 1965 Act was a truly bipartisan bill, and it remained a bipartisan issue really up through 2006, and only stopped being a bipartisan issue then. Part of the reason it was a bipartisan issue, though, is that the evil against which the Voting Rights Act was directed was so clear that people were, and, and so visible, that you could build a coalition with people who were not themselves directly affected. That is, if you look at where the Voting Rights Act of 1965 came from, a lot of the power behind it was Midwest Republicans from states that had relatively small minority populations, but they were shocked and appalled by what they saw on television on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, right? And that ability to build coalitions, which is, I think, some of what both of the people to my left on the panel were talking about, is a very powerful part of why the Voting Rights Act succeeded when it did and why the opposition to the act came about uh, when the opposition to the act came about. Um, and that, you know, and, and this goes to a broader issue, which I think Neil uh, was also pointing at. If I had had the 15 minutes that I originally thought I was going to have, I was actually going to compare why the gay rights movement has succeeded in the Supreme Court with why the voting rights movement has failed. And if I could capture it in a, in a 10 second version of this, it is no one who is in power ever wakes up to discover that their child is black or their child is poor or their child is undocumented. And people in power wake up every day to find that out about their children with regard to sexual orientation. Um, and that has been probably the most powerful explanation of why the Supreme Court feels differently. Because the, Justice Kennedy knows and likes lots of people who are gay. He doesn't know nearly as many people who are African American or Latino or undocumented. And that is a powerful explanatory factor. Well, a little earlier, I beat the drum for two minutes um, uh, about, about culture and, and its uh, uh, determine, determining uh, consequences for, for law and, and, and politics. And I want to do it again just for, for a minute. <coughs> Because it seems to me that, it, that if you, like I, are astonished by how um, you know, presumably bright people like um, Justice Rehnquist or, or Justice Roberts or Scalia um, or Clarence Thomas can possibly think and write the way, the, the way they do, uh, placing, for, for example, uh, the dignity of, of, of states uh, as more important than the dignity of uh, some undocumented uh, immigrant, perhaps like my father, uh, who could be uh, rousted out of bed uh, some morning and, and uh, de uh, deported, or that uh, the dignity of a, of a black teenager walking out on the sidewalk one, one evening and a police cruiser uh, pull, pulls alongside and, and the usual thing, uh, thing happens. Uh, that that might seem to you uh, uh, that way of thinking might seem so alien, so so bizarre that it calls for for, for explanation. Where did right wing uh, political thought and, and, and legal thought like that? Where did it where did it come from? 
Now, uh, uh, indulge me for, for a second. Imagine you're, you're a fairly uh, bright, young, um, white, upper-class kid um, living in, in Arizona and going to school there. Your, your, your family are fa fairly privileged, and so they take pretty good, good care of you. But uh, your, uh, your society is, is, is changing around you. Every, every day, the, the faces and the mixture of languages that you hear on the, on the sidewalk, um, the mixture of kids in your class in school, you're in second grade, say, uh, change from, from year, to, year to year. Now, wh what you hear from um, authority figures, parents, teachers, and so on, about those changes can make a deep impression on you. Let, let's suppose that the young William Rehnquist, uh, when he was young and impressionable, uh, was driving down the street with his, his, his family, and he, he saw something striking on the sidewalk, and he says, Dad, um, what's, what, what's going on with that guy? Uh, the, the next words out of the father's mouth, mouth could make a, a deep impression on him. Oh, he's in, uh, probably a Mexican immigrant who's struggling to bring things home uh, to his family. They're probably trying to set up a household and you know, get a job and get ahead. It's just typical immigrant story. Our ancestors, your aunt and so on, when they uh, immigrated here from Ireland, uh, struggled in, in similar fashion. If, if he hears that story... Uh, or if he hears a different story, oh, there's so many of those, it's like a flood and an invasion. Or something at school, um, in, in first grade, there were hardly any Mexican kids, but in, in second grade, there, there are two, and one is pretty smart, and the other one is having uh, trouble learning English, uh, begs for an explanation. He talks about it with someone, a teacher, a counselor, a parent, and they could hear one story or another. Now, it, if, if a thousand million people are, are having those conversations and in, in, in forming in impressions and w uh, templates and ways of understanding what's going on in the region, and particularly if it's a region like, like Arizona or California that's, that's in transition, starting to approach the, the, tip, the tipping point, then uh, the, uh, the, the cultural in, in influences on a sensitive kid, bright kid, William Wankris, maybe Roberts too, I don't know, we know where he grew up, I think in Indiana, um, could, uh, uh, could motivate the kid to grow up, prompt the kid to grow up one way or another with a certain uh, set of, um, uh, my, a certain mindset, pre presuppositions, what, uh, understandings of what the word dignity, equality, equal opportunity, and, and, and so on mean. So I think we, uh, it, it, it's fine to, to rail against a bad, a bad history. It's fine to pay attention to economics the way Derek, Derek Bell told us to. But I think we have to pay attention to, to culture and the way people make, make sense of it, especially in parts of the country that are in, in transition and that are, that are, that are, that are uh, you know, confused and trying to make sense of it all. Very briefly, um, the coalition that the Republican Party put together of uh, becoming the um, preferred party of many whites in the South that I think was largely racially driven, in combination with the economic interests of the privileged upper class generally, um, it's always important to remember that the sort of transformations that we see in our electoral politics with the Republican Party gaining power have led to massive, massive uh, concentrations of wealth in the part of the hands of a few, and the opportunity to continually provide them across generations. So it's your institutionalizing privilege, if you will, which is a white Southern pattern. This is not a surprise to folks here. Has an attractiveness, right? So it's the combination of privilege, maintaining privilege in wealth and race that allowed, I think, for a, an effective coalition to be put together, and all of that was in reaction to the racial progress that occurred in the, um, in the, in the, um, in the country as a result of the civil rights era and all of the laws that were passed. One, one final point. Remember the 1993 decision of the Supreme Court in um, Shaw v. Reno, where Sandra Day O'Connor, also from Arizona, also raised in Arizona, don't know if it has something to, where William Rehnquist was. There's something about the desert air, <laughs> um, I, I assume. Um, wrote a devastating critique of the importance of racial identity, minority, racial minority identity in the United States. 
said it was counter to the country, would destroy the country, would lead to balkanization. That legitimized, if you will, the larger discourse about limiting the potential empowerment, in my view, limiting the potential empowerment of communities of color. Can I just say one very, very, very brief thing, which is Arizona is a deeply problematic state, and we should blame them for a lot. But we should not be blaming Arizona for William Rehnquist. He grew up in the north and came to Arizona as a lawyer, already trained as a lawyer. So the idea that that's when he changed. Yeah, that's when he got to Arizona. Well, I don't know. I don't know about that. But I, I, I mean, I just think it's important to recognize that the northern roots of this problem as well, which is, you know, he grew up in Wisconsin, which we are now seeing has its own kind of interesting pathologies about voting. I, I, don't, I don't think I should be blamed for him personally. Yeah, just really briefly, I think, you know, that there's a context outside of the Roberts Court for this counter-revolution, which, if I put it in, in terms of a Berkeley professor, I would say it's that one side of the political aisle has decided that they They've seen the demographic writing on the wall, and they decided, they've decided that they are going to go straight up gangster in order to <laughs> win. I mean, um, I mean there, there used to be this antiquated concept that political scientists uh, talked about and studied, which is this idea of responsible parties. Right. Yeah. That in a, in a two-party uh, pluralist democracy, there's a certain responsibility that comes with each of the two parties to try to organize, to be vessels of... Uh, ideas and ideologies and to try to organize as much as possible a competition between visions uh, of what is in the best interest of the country. I think one party has completely ad abdicated that sense of responsibility. And so yesterday, uh, somebody uh, mentioned that the Republican Party has become the party of white nationalism. And I don't entirely disagree with that, but I think there was an important prior uh, um, evolution of the Republican Party um, that enabled the Republican Party to become the mess that it is today, which is, I think, the, the work of uh, folks like Lee Atwater and especially Karl Rove, this idea that um, the ends justify the means in terms of what happens in, in politics. And I think that really set the stage for what you see now, which is a party that even the Republican Party doesn't quite know what to do with. So, so I thought in, instead of um, you ask a good question. Instead of adding to the thoughts that have been offered on diagnosis, I might say a little bit about uh, solutions. Uh, uh, and, and the first, you know, the first thought that comes to mind, uh, uh, and this is and, and this is something that that Pam, uh, this is in response to what Pam said. How do you get most Americans uh, uh, to, uh, of good will to view people of color um, the way they view? or increasingly coming to view gay people, uh, transgender people, um, gay people more than transgender people. Um, uh, but there's movement in, in those directions. Uh, and there's something about uh, a relentless education and re-education in empathy, uh, in really teaching people when they're very young to imagine the world from someone else's point of view. Um, um, and that's easy to say. It's easy to just say we need to, you know, fix the educational system. But I mean, I mean, there are so many ways, lar large and small, my kids come home from school uh, and talk about this. And it's not typically along lines of, of race, but it's about um, trying to see what it's like for a kid in class who's having certain kinds of difficulties and other kids don't want to work with them. And, you know, um, and then, you know, um, um, one of my one of my kids and my, they'll step up, right? And they, they can see that they've learned to see the situation from their point of view. Uh, and it's so much easier if you can imagine it happening to your, to your children. Uh, my kid could be gay. Uh, you want to win a Fourth Amendment case at the Supreme Court, right? The joke is, um, right, convince the justices it could happen to them. Uh, I think there's really, if you could really, if, if more people could imagine their kids being African American and walking down the street, uh, it's never going to happen, right, uh, for white parents of white children. But if you could actually... Um, the more that, the more we, we teach people, train people to think that way. Uh, I think it's an important part of being a good lawyer and a good judge. You don't just bring your experience to bear. You actually really have to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Uh, that's the first point I want to make. And the second point I want to make, um, I, you know, um, I'm an integrationist uh, at heart. And it, 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 some of that is I can't fully defend. It's faith. It's a certain vision of America. But I do think, actually, this is an argument for integration in integrated settings. Uh, 
not in all ways, in all contexts, right? Uh, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have um, separate racial or ethnic identities or separate spaces, uh, but, but it is much harder to other people the more you spend time around them. Um, it is harder to do it. It is hard to make them into simple symbols of things you don't like or attribute responsibility to them for things they haven't done when you actually spend time with them. Uh, and so uh, that's uh, at least something, something to think about. Thank you. And looking at the hour, I think now what we'll do, we'll turn to the audience for questions. And if you would state your name and affiliation, I'll see your hands first. And Can we just wait until they get the mics up? Okay, they're going to bring mics because it's been recorded. And we'll take three questions. I have one, two, three. And then we'll do another round. Woman in the blue shirt. And the woman in the back. Uh, thank you for all of your comments. Uh, my question, uh, I actually have two questions that are related, uh, kind of uh, nuanced questions, uh, nuanced ironic questions directed uh, pr primarily at uh, Professor Lee, but I'd be happy to hear anyone's thoughts about them because uh, these are about uh, Asian Americans, uh, but I think they inform the broader discourse here. So, uh, Professor Lee, you do uh, work on political participation among Asian Americans, and you know I've cited some of your work. And, uh, you know, you report that uh, among Asian Indian Americans, about 90% support President Obama, 60% uh, support their Democratic congressional rep representative, as opposed to maybe 30% supporting the Republican representative. And yet the two most prominent Asian Indian American politicians are conservative Republican governors, Bobby Jindal uh, and Nikki Haley. Uh, so my first question is, you know, what does that say about the Republican Party and, you know, the political discourse in this country? Uh, now, I don't like Bobby Jindal at all, uh, <laughs> but if I was a, you know, right-wing extremist, uh, I, I, you know, I think he should have gotten more support in the Republican Party. You know, I mean, if I was a right-wing extremist, uh, you know, he would be my guy. And not just because he's South Asian, you know, just because, you know, he actually knows something about policy. I just don't like his policy at all. Uh, but the reason I point that out is, you know, at least, uh, you know, I can say, well, there is a prominent uh, South Asian American who's a presidential candidate. There has never been an East Asian American uh, who's been a national presidential candidate. In fact, besides uh, Governor Gary Locke of Washington, I don't believe there's been any East Asian American prominent politician elected in a non majority Asian American district. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering why that is. Is it because, uh, not to be disrespectful, but is it because, say, someone like you looks more foreign than someone like me? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I get labeled as foreign, but I could pass for white. I, you know, I think you'd have a harder time uh, passing for white. Is, is that why it is, or is there another explanation for the, the difference we see here uh, with, with respect to East Asian and South Asian Americans and, and the broader discourse on Asian Americans more generally? Um. I think, I think those are several questions bundled uh, together. So, you know, I think on the, on, I, so it is a bit of a, a paradox in, at the surface, if you think about the fact that by our estimates, Asian Indians uh, vote about 90% Democratic, uh, which are rates that people typically assume uh, are only found among African American voters, that they vote that highly Democratic, and yet you have, um, uh, Nikki Haley and Bobby Jindal, but I think that is simply because those are very uh, visible instances of um, Asian American representation in high political offices. Those are the most visible instances. It would be uh, more telling to actually see what the partisanship of Asian American uh, elected officials uh, looks like across all levels of politics, where it's much more heavily Democratic than it is Republican. And also to see what the real sort of uh, representational uh, gaps look like uh, for Asian Americans as opposed to other groups. So in 1999, there was a, a group of um, uh, women of color in political science who collected systematic data, not just at the federal level, but also at the state and local level to see which groups were uh, represented at, at levels that approached parity and which groups were represented at levels that were far below uh, parity. And, you know, uh, of the, you know, between whites, uh, African Americans, Latinos, and Asian Americans, the, the group that was least well represented uh, at the state and uh, local levels of political office and also at the federal level uh, were Asian Americans. That's 1999. I now have a graduate student who is collecting that same kind of data uh, in 2015. Um, and so in 1999, um, 
uh, 0.9%, so not 90, 0.9%, less than 1% of uh, state and legislative offices were held by uh, Asian Americans. This was at a time where Asian Americans were about a little over 3% of the general population. Um, uh, today, Asian Americans are above 6% of the general population, and by her uh, analysis, uh, at the state and local levels, Asian Americans are still 0.9% of all held political offices. So uh, while the number of voters has grown, while the number of jurisdictions in which Asian Americans are 10 or 20% of the voting uh, electorate has grown, uh, that, that figure has stayed uh, relatively um, constant. There are probably other questions that were embedded in your comment that I haven't had a chance to answer, but I'm happy to. Well, I think these are these are very rare events. So you know, when they when they happen, I'm not sure we should make uh, too much of them. And I would even apply that to the election of uh, Barack Obama. I mean, if you looked at most of the political science literature previous to 2008, if you if you polled persons like uh, Dr. Fraga and myself, who study racial and ethnic politics before 2008, and asked, "Does Barack Obama stand, you know, a chance in heck of being elected president of the United States in 2008?" I think almost all of us would have said no. And so, I think the fact that he got uh, he he succeeded um, doesn't mean that something fundamental has changed in terms of the dynamics of race and electoral politics in the country. The the structures that would have made uh, President Obama's electoral success seemed like a near impossibility, I think still remain. Um, the only thing that has changed is that in the eyes of children like mine, they are now able to see what it might look like for somebody who is other than, someone other than a older white gentleman uh, to serve in the highest office, uh, you know, uh, elected office of the land. So that has changed, but I think a lot of the other structures remain uh, the same. TLA School of Law. And I, first of all, wanted to thank you for all of your comments, but I wanted to press because the name of the panel was Race, Political Participation in the Roberts Court. And I feel there's a sort of formalism running through this focus on voting because there are other forms of political participation and no one has talked about the campaign finance decisions of this court, which I think have significant implications for what you think your vote is worth. When you think of money, where it's unlimited dollars, right, available to certain individuals to influence the political process, and you have one vote. So one thing I'd like to hear from you is how does the campaign finance decision m affect this set of concerns about voter turnout, mobilization, and registration? The other form of participation is social movements, and we've heard a lot about social movements at this conference perhaps in response to the perception that ordinary politics has failed. And how do you think the Roberts Court will react if we see increasing amounts of social movements, some of them go viral, in response to the failure of ordinary politics? Will that change their decisions about the process of ordinary politics or their decisions about how you police dissent? I'll start on this, this campaign finance and then let someone else answer this, the social movement part of it. Uh, I, I view the, the Citizens United decision and the Shelby County decision as the two evil twins of the Roberts Court. Uh, and I think you're absolutely right that they work in conjunction. They are both examples of trying to give the most powerful and the most affluent Americans even more power and to try to give everyone else even less power. And I wrote a piece uh, for The Nation earlier this year talking about how the wealth primary is functioning as a new form of a poll tax by excluding who is even considered as a candidate, who can even think about running, and then who even gets to the stage of being able to compete in a primary and then a general election. So what we're seeing is that the amount of money in the political system is making it very, very difficult to field more diverse candidates. And that in places where we have public financing, like New York City, for example, where we actually incentivize small donations, you see much more diversity in terms of who is able to first run for office and then who is able to be elected. I think the campaign, I have to be honest, I think the campaign finance issue and Citizens United in particular is a distraction more than a cause. That is, the money in politics was there before Citizens United, uh, and it's a product of a broader First Amendment issue than anything in Citizens United itself. Um, 
you know, Donald Trump is running for president as a billionaire. He's spent none of his own money so far. And it's not as if the problem there is Citizens United in any event, which would have been just about a particular kind of corporate corporate financing. So, you know, the money issue in politics and the wealth issue in politics is an important one. Uh, I'm not at all sure that campaign finance law is the is the problem there. Um, on, this, on the social movements issue, it will be very interesting, I think, to see the following thing, which is the social movements issue and the, and the campaign finance issue are linked in one way, at least when they get to the Supreme Court, and that is the question of what the First Amendment means, because, this, because social movements depend on the First Amendment as a way of protecting a particular kind of dissent. And it will be very interesting to see if a court that has been quite robust in a variety of First Amendment protections gives the same kind of First Amendment protection to protesters uh, that it has given, the, and social movement protesters and progressive social movement protesters, that it has given to people like the Westboro Baptist Church sure. and Citizens United and the like. And that will be a very interesting thing to see. Um, but you know, we could have public financing in this country of elections, even under Citizens United. The problem is we can't build a social movement that wants public financing and is willing to finance it in a way that would get us away from uh, that would get us away from the money uh, that a couple of very rich individuals are putting into the system. Marginal, pe marginal people are, are acutely aware of when the fix is on. They're, they're constantly beset by, uh, by, by hoaxers, fraudsters, scam artists, uh, people who want to take advantage of them. Uh, and, and, and so they, 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 they know that money uh, speaks. And when, the, when marginal people hear about yeah, Citizens United, to, to them the reaction is, so what else is, what, what else is, is, is new? So of course a decision like, like that would, would um, suppress the, the, the vote of, of minorities, particularly poor minorities and marginal people everywhere. They, have a, they, they hear, hear about it and they have a sinking feeling, uh, oh, here, here, we, here we go again. It's only people like, like, like us whose th thinking is, is contorted, distorted by my law school who could possibly think <laughs> of Citizens United as a, a First Amendment a case and, and, and could, could possibly think that corporations are a kind of person who, who is entitled to, to speak and to speak through, through, through money, through a billion dollar uh, do, donation. It's, uh, in a way, they're the smart ones and we're the ones whose, whose clarity of thought is, is, is clouded over and who, who, take, who can possibly take cases like Citizens United half seri seriously. So that, that's why, probably, Citizens United, in cases in that vein, suppress the minority vote. It's just a further reminder that no one cares about them or, or their thought or their vote. Can I quote you, Richard? <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say that the political science literature is, is pretty clear. Uh, money doesn't matter which is a sign of the deficiencies of the political science literature in understanding important elements of politics. <laughs> that, that is, we all have this instinct that says money should matter and does matter, but when you put it into the statistical models, it isn't as much a guarantee as we would think. Is it leading to candidate diminution? That is, fewer people running because of potential opposition, perhaps. Uh, I understand Citizens United as a clear expression of the vision of this court of fairness in democracy. And it doesn't care about that. It's a very clear statement that, you know, privilege can maintain its privilege, and it doesn't guarantee it winning, but it gives it a chance to be much more, um, much more competitive. There's no reason to think, in my view, that the current five-member majority on the court will take a view of dissent that is similar to the First Amendment view that it took with regards to having an independent voice. I think they would find a way, I have to think, they would find a way, especially if the voices of dissent, the voices of social protest, are so racially identified, they would have to find a way to limit it, whether it's the impact on society, social stability, the needs of the state to maintain order. I think they would easily find a way around a reconciliation with their decision in Citizens United. I just wanted to speak to the social movements point, uh, which is that uh, 
the court already has been responsive to them, and I think it's going to continue to be like courts before it. And these movements come on the left and they come on the right. right? So Heller and McDonald uh, are the result of a decades-long social movement for a certain kind of law and order individual rights conception of the Second Amendment. And by the way, if you want to see the conservative majority on the Roberts Court exude empathy for people of color, read what they say, uh, particularly in McDonald, to justify it as an individual right, the rights of the freedmen in the wake of the Civil War and all the, the evidence at the time of Reconstruction that robust Second Amendment protections were necessary for former slaves to protect themselves and their family. And by the way, mere formal equality would not be enough. No one may possess firearms as formal equality. That would have a huge disparate impact on they didn't, people of color in the South uh, who wouldn't be able to protect themselves. So uh, you see responsiveness of social movements. That's not going to change, but they're, they're not just coming from the left. Just really quickly on the, um, on the point that Citizens United may be more of a, a distraction than a real thing. I think, you know, Citizens United is like the latest mold on a rot that's been there for a very, very long period. I mean, it's, it's the really ugly kind of mold that gets a little bit of an orange-reddish tinge. So it's not just any mold mold. But the rot has been there from, you know, um, the rot being this idea that money uh, unduly influences politics and that there are el elements of our democracy that look much more like a plutocracy than the democracy that we learned in in grade school. Nick Carnes, who's a professor here at the School of Public Policy at Duke, has collected some uh, really illuminating data on the degree to which um, the working class is represented in politics. And you know, over time through uh, redistricting and the changing demographics of the country, uh, African Americans and Latinos have uh, been able to enjoy slightly more representation than they've had in the past. But the percent of Congress that is that 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 has any real experience, not the kind of Carly Fiorina experience with being in the working class, has gone from something that looks like one percent to something that looks like much lower than uh, one percent. Um, and so I think you know this the, the the rot has always been there. This is just the latest. Uh, it's more of a consequence uh, of the rot that we have. Citizens United. I think those orange things are called lichens, and they they're very long lived. <laughs> They're very hard to scrape off. They bond chemically with, with the rock, and they require quite a bit of effort to, um, <laughs> to remove. They're, they're a metaphor for the, for the task of, of uh, uh, folks like uh, ones in this, or this room. Okay, um, John Kahn, Hamlin University School of Law. So the thing, one of the things that struck me most in all the presentations was in the chart of the relative change of voting is how much progress was made in the decade before the passage of the Voting Rights Act. And so a couple of things rel relative to that, because I, I'm not a scholar of the history of voting rights, sort of, you know, um, how you, what you make of that level of progress in the decade after the passage of the Voting Rights Act being relatively flat, um, and connecting that to the idea of, right, that, that as important as the Voting Rights Act is, right, um, or any of these laws, right? That that law is not destiny, and that neither is demography. And I, the, one of my concerns, and I'm not on this panel, but in a lot of the discussion of voting rights, is people just think, oh, we're going to be majority minority, you know, that that the demography is in favor of a more liberal approach to you know, yada yada, um, and this almost complacency about demography being de destiny, um, and just a, a sort of comment on a general concern about that, because obviously. Um, you know, it never has been destiny, right? Otherwise, you'd have more than 1% of working class people represented in Congress. I mean, there's, so anyway, so I'll leave it at that. My name is Sahara Aziz. I'm a law professor at Texas A&M School of Law. So I was uh, intrigued by the comment that uh, one reason that judges have become more sympathetic to LGBT civil rights issues is because they've humanized them and they've seen the potential, if not the reality, that their own children and grandchildren could fall within to that subordinated group. So how does that inform the um, effect of the increasing interracial marriage process that's happening? And, and to what degree is interracial marriage becoming a changing demographic reality as well? Um, and how can we think about that as an opportunity 
to um, uh, convince judges and, and lawmakers that you know you, your children, your grandchildren could marry someone who is black, Hispanic, Arab, South Asian, East Asian, et cetera, and then they will have to face the discrimination that you have created through these structures. Um, and again, I'm assuming that interracial marriage has gotten is, is increasing to the degree that this will be a reality, but it seems that that's part of the demographic shift and connected to the LGBT assessment of why they've been so successful as a group in expanding their civil rights. Just one more. Yeah. So I was thinking um, towards the tail end of the discussion, and I was thinking about how um, slave owners, overseers, and Southern people in general have through history spent a lot of time with black people, but it's usually been in a colonial relationship or a property um, owner relationship. And so um, thinking about that um, and how that there's this popular imagination of black people as a menace or even less than people, how through legal means you could change that imagination versus just relational, or how would you change the relations now to enable um, that relation to matter, um, or that proximity to white people, or p white people's proximity to black people to matter and how they imagine um, black people. And then um, kind of related to that, um, I know there are moments in history where um, coalitions between poor white people and black people um, started to <laughs> ferment and then dissipated, and so um, what conditions we need to happen now to see um, something like that happening again? So I'll respond to the question about what was happening in the 1950s. Part of what was happening in the 1950s were um, some voter registration drives in the North and the uh, very great challenges of uh, trying with, with difficulty, but voter registration efforts that occurred um, in the South as well. The big jump that occurs is right after 65. What the data you know, try to capture is that jump from 64 to 65, and that's when you see the big increase. Remember, this isn't just voter registration. This is voters as a percent of the electorate. It's actual voters turning out. The reason that you see this consistency subsequently is because you're maintaining a level of voter participation at the same time as well. On the question of a demography is destiny, I think none of us here are saying, well, certainly I'm not saying that demography is destiny at all. That, that's the whole question that we're raising, is the way in which demography is not destiny. I like to say, having lived in California for 16 years, that California is the example of what many in the Republican Party don't want to happen anywhere else. That is, it's the example of how demography, in combination with active uh, coalitions with labor in combination, funded by labor, active coalitions across racial and ethnic lines with progressive, quote unquote, progressive white voters in the state of California can transform, to some degree, California still has its challenges, but transform the nature of partisan politics. Part of, of Dick Armey's um, uh, redrawing of, of district boundary lines, congressional district boundary lines in Texas, was to say the demography of Texas isn't quite California, but it sure is similar. We know how to switch that. E. e. Schott Snyder, a uh, famous political scientist in the late 50s, early 60s, said that the most important politics is the politics about politics, that is, about voting and elections, about the rules of the game. You switch the rules of the game, then you can set all different courses of action to privilege some interests over others. I just wanted to say really quickly in terms of North Carolina is a good example of uh, the impact of not just the Voting Rights Act, but things that came after it. So uh, in 1965, uh, before the Voting Rights Act, 46.8 percent of black North Carolinians were registered to vote, compared to 96.8 percent of white North Carolinians. So there, there was a, almost a 50-point uh, disparity. That narrowed after 1965, but the gap still remained significant. Uh, and then beginning in 2000, North Carolina adopted a series of reforms, things like early voting, same-day voter registration, the ability to vote anywhere in your precinct. And then we saw that registration gap close dramatically. Uh, and we began to see a black turnout increase over white turnout for the first time, not in national, not just in national politics, but in state politics as well. And so what we see is that the new reforms really were the things that made so much of the Voting Rights Act real. And, and that's why losing these things in North Carolina or cutting back on them has had such a big impact. Um, two, two, two 
um, points. The, the first it, it goes to short-term versus long-term views on demography and the like, which is in California, the kind of common political wisdom now, I think, is that the Republican Party could have gained significant traction among Latinos in California because of its views on a number of social issues, but its support for Prop 187 completely devastated the party for another generation. And so this idea of re responsible party government and long-term versus short-term thoughts by parties has a lot to do with the demography. The second point, which um, goes to demography, and Rick Banks, who's sitting in the back of the room, is m much more of an expert on this than me, but the, the relative levels of interracial and interethnic marriage against different groups vary dramatically, and that's particularly true for African Americans relative to every other group in America, that the outmarriage rate among Latinos, second and third generation Latinos in the United States, is over 50 percent. Um, whereas for uh, African Americans in the United States, the outmarriage rates are still very low. I'm right about that, right, Rick, still? Yeah. yeah. And, and <laughs> yeah. He's just always nice to me, which is why I, I um, but, but, but I mean, so that's another thing is that this question of whether um, as society changes, that changes in the same way for every racial uh, and ethnic minority is, is a really important one, which may go back also finally to the point about the difference in the election rates among uh, Asian Americans and other minority groups is even in places where you might think there is a large Asian American concentration, it's often impossible to draw majority Asian American election districts. And so if you ask, why do we have so many black and Latino elected officials in the country, most of them are still elected from majority black or majority Latino districts. And e even in New York City, for example, which has a large Chinatown and then a large uh, uh, Chinese population in Queens, it was impossible to draw a single city council district out of 51 that would be majority uh, Asian American. And so that may be a, a little bit, you know, recognizing that the claims and the issues that relate to different uh, minority groups may be quite different in all of these contexts might be might be relevant. Yo, you have the last word. Yeah, I want to acknowledge the importance of the other, uh, the other two questions uh, because um, my guess is that most Americans with children uh, haven't really asked themselves the question, what are my grandchildren going to look like? And boy, I never asked myself that question, right? Um, I've thought about, you know, maybe I'll have grandchildren, maybe I won't. That's actually up, for my, that's up to my children to decide, but that's another whole issue. Um, but if we imagine grandchildren, you know, and I imagine most people think they're going to look like what my children look like and what I look like. And um, it's a whole lot more complicated than that. And so that could be a very powerful way of reaching people of good faith. It could trigger more racism in people of bad faith, right? I, I'm going to make damn sure what my grandchildren are going to look like. <laughs> but, but, th but that's not, I don't think that's, I don't think that's um, most, uh, most people. So I think that's a very powerful way of saying, you know, do this for your grandchildren. Don't just do it for someone else. You should be more compassionate towards. And then in terms, of, in terms of your question, I mean, it's a great point, which is that white people and people of color have a long history, uh, certainly in this part of the country, of living in very close proximity uh, to one another. And if that's all that one means by an integrated setting, well, then one is not said very much. So it makes a whole lot of difference uh, what those interactions uh, look like and whether they're premised on real substantive, robust equality, uh, equal citizenship, or whether it's uh, done in a more right, traditional um, um, uh, hierarchical uh, uh, way that, that, that to our national shame has characterized uh, race relations uh, for, far, for far too long. So thank you. Thank you for that question. Let us thank the panel, and, and thank you for your question.